All right, uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so a few quick announcements. Uh, the exam is, of course, this Wednesday. There's, uh, I'll be in my office from right after class until 4.30 this afternoon. If you have questions, you can come by. Um, and there's also a question and answer review session tonight at 9 o'clock, uh, right across the hall from my office, uh, over in that corner of Wien Hall. Um, there, today we're going to be continuing talking about cancer, introducing a little bit of stuff about the immune system. Um, the immune system is going to come back up a little bit. We're not going to go into very much depth about it, but it is going to come back up a little bit in Unit 3 when we talk about malaria. Um, as a reminder, there's already a homework assignment about the malaria reading that's up on Canvas. That's going to be due November 8th. There's one other homework assignment due November 1st. Um, which is also going to be visible on Canvas as soon as, uh, right after the exam. Um, there's also an updated syllabus that has revised a couple of dates and a couple of chapters and so on um, up on Canvas as well. So if you go to syllabus, the original syllabus that I handed out the first day of class is there, and then there's another link for a PDF with an updated schedule. Um, so all of that is up there. Um, th there's new, but the new material from today, so even though we'll be talking about cancer, um, and in talking about cancer, I'll probably mention a couple things that you've already learned about cancer, including P53. Um, that is, uh, those reminders are things that you should know and be ready for on the exam. But the new thing is about immune, uh, the immune system and its interaction with cancer won't be on the exam uh, on Wednesday. Um, any questions about... The, the this coming up, the stuff coming up, or uh, any of the schedule or exam stuff, logistics. Okay, um, so today we're going to talk about um, something that uh, has, over the last um, really four or five years, um, gotten a ton of press, at least among sort of uh, um, uh, people who follow like uh, uh, biotechnology, um, and that is um, using personalized medicine approaches to um, combat cancer um, by taking advantage of the body's immune system and modifying the body's immune system to help to essentially teach your body's immune system to fight cancer. Um, this has been most effective with um, leukemias and lymphomas. Um, and uh, in just in the last few months, the FDA approved this, um, what had been experimental treatment, um, as, a, uh, as an acceptable uh, uh, you know, clinical treatment for um, leukemias and lymphomas. Um, there's uh, there's um, a lot of continued research in this area. Um, what we're going to talk about today is some of the um, uh, sort of reminders about cancer, um, a little bit of an introduction to the immune system um, and retrovirus, and then just sort of a general overview of cancer immunotherapy. Um, if you go to Canvas for today, I just posted several articles that go into a lot more depth about this if you're interested in understanding more about this. Um, and so for today, we'll talk about kind of reminders about DNA damage and protection from mutations, um, and then talk a little bit about the immune system, how the immune system functions, um, a little bit about retroviruses, um, which are a useful uh, tool um, in biology in general, um, and then also, uh, and then cancer immunotherapy as well. Um, so... Uh, we've, I've shown this slide before once, um, but there are a variety of different types of damage that can occur in DNA. Um, uh, damage in DNA can be, uh, uh, you can have uh, single strand breaks where the uh, sugar phosphate backbone breaks apart um, on one strand or double stranded breaks where the, the chromosome falls apart um, uh, on both strands. Um, because histones and other molecules and other proteins um, keep the DNA somewhat organized in the cell, when there are double stranded DNA breaks, those sometimes can be repaired by the cell. Uh, and the uh, uh, cell can sort of figure out where the DNA goes back together. Um, but, uh, and, and actually, interestingly, sometimes it will even use the homologous chromosome from the other parent as a guide to help it. Um, and how that happens at a sort of mechanistic level is really quite poorly understood. Um, uh, we know that haploid cells don't do as well as diploid cells at, um, at repairing double-stranded breaks, which is one of the pieces of evidence that indicates that this other uh, homologous chromosome is helping. Um, but how that is accomplished is hard to figure out because um, 
in, uh, in interphase and even in mitosis, um, except for meiosis, which we haven't talked about yet, when cells, um, uh, when, when, um, cells go through two rounds of division to produce haploid gamete cells like sperm and eggs, um, the homologous chromosomes um, never come together. Um, in interphase, when the cell is not in mitosis, um, uh, chromosome 1 from mom has sort of its own little region of the nucleus that it hangs out in, and chromosome 1 from dad has its own little region in the nucleus that it hangs out in, um, but those two regions are not immediately adjacent to each other. Um, and so how it is that the, that the cell is able to um, infer uh, something from the, from the one chromosome is a little bit of a mystery. Um, then there are other things where um, uh, ultraviolet light can cause um, can cause bases to come to, to sort of uh, covalently attach to each other, um, which can cause T's to be read either as a single C or as uh, two T's can come together and be read as a single C, um, or two T's can come together and be read as two C's, um, uh, and so that can cause um, uh, problems. And then also um, sometimes a single base is just missing or added other chemical modifications. Um, a lot of the cell's machinery, the tumor suppressor genes that we've been talking about, um, their job is to look for these kinds of damage and repair them. Um, if the damage goes unrepaired, then that can result in a mutation, then that often usually will result in a mutation. Um, and those mutations usually are in non-coding regions or would be, non or would be conservative um, or, um, or occasionally would be, um, would be a loss of function mutation in a gene. Um, loss of function mutations in a gene are, of course, problematic, especially when they're in tumor suppressor genes um, from an organism's perspective. Um, a loss of function mutation in something like phosphofructokinase would be problematic from the cell's perspective, but as an organism, I can handle losing a few cells. Um, uh, and especially, of course, if both copies of a tumor suppressor gene carry loss of function mutations, that's a problem. Um, gain of function mutations, while they're extremely, extremely, extremely rare, when they do happen, if they happen in a proto-oncogene, those are also problematic, and that's a dominant sort of problem. Uh, from the cells and the organism's perspective. So anyway, that's sort of, yeah, just background of that. Any questions about any of that before we kind of move on to the, some of the newer stuff for today? Um, so again, we talked before about P53. I showed a different image before about P53, but this shows some of the same stuff where the, when there is DNA damage, proteins like BRCA1 and BRCA2 and other proteins that look for d uh, damaged DNA. Um, the book talks about Zermodoma pigmentosum A or XPA, um, which is not one that you need to remember, but they these proteins detect damage, activate P53. P53 proliferates and then turns on other genes that stop the cell cycle um, and either prevent the cell from dividing, or if the DNA damage goes unrepaired, and, and, and try to repair the DNA damage, um, if the DNA damage goes unrepaired for, um, for a long period of time, um, several minutes to an hour or so, then P53's continued activation will trigger the cell to undergo apoptosis, which is um, programmed cell death, where the cell will, um, will kill itself so that the organism um, does not have this mutation persisting in one of its cells. Um, and again, uh, uh, as a cell, uh, you know, um, uh, DNA polymerase 3, initially about 1 in 10,000 bases, there's a mistake. It corrects 99 or 99.5 or something percent of the mistakes because it feels behind itself and backs up and corrects errors when it makes it. Um, but still, we have um, uh, a few thousand mutations that P DNA polymerase 3 lets through after, um, by the end of S phase. So when the cell gets back around to get ready to copy the DNA again, it will recheck to s and, and try and detect and repair those thousand or so mutations. And most of the time, it will get all of them or nearly all of them, and maybe one or two will um, will sort of continue, will, 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 will persist on through DNA replication, and then one of the two daughter cells will carry that mutation uh, for, for the rest of its life and for the rest of the life of all of its progeny cells that it makes. Um, yeah, sure. Are the proteins that you may the size the same as the ones that kill the cell? Um, yes, it will. Um, those proteins get turned on a little bit more slowly than the ones that, that try to repair the DNA damage. But it will. But yeah, when it, some of the proteins that P53 turns on will be proteins that will kill the cell. Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, um, does P53 only 
only like cause the cell cycle, or does it does it also check for damaged DNA and like do things with apoptosis and do Right, so it doesn't actually itself check for damaged DNA. It gets activated by a number of other proteins that check for damaged DNA. I've kind of shorthanded that because we haven't talked about a lot of the other proteins. And so if you say on an exam, P53 checks for DNA damage, you won't lose points for me. But if you take the cancer bio class, when they get into the details of that, then you, then you would lose points on that in that point. Um, I, I sort of skimmed over that and said P53 checks for damage, which is wrong but close enough, I guess, um, in the sense that it, um, it actually, other protein, BRCA1, BRCA2, XPA, um, uh, oh, what's the other, I can't remember the names, there, there, there are a dozen or so other proteins that actually physically look at the DNA and make physical contact with the DNA and detect the damage directly. P53, um, only when it gets activated, then it starts acting like a transcription factor and turns on other things. But then what it does do is it does turn on genes that will activate repair pathways and also will activate um, uh, apoptosis pathways. Um, yeah, sure. So does that mean that um, if you have like two copies of functioning P53 but you were missing um, both copies of the um, of the proteins that detected the mutation, then you would still get cancer because P53 would be activated. Um, it depends a little bit. So. Um, so the one example that we've talked about is BRCA2. And in, if, um, so I, I think I have in here my picture of Angelina Jolie. But anyway, Angelina Jolie found out that she, is a care, she has one defective copy of BRCA2. Um, and, uh, and so um, that, that's in all of her cells. And so um, probabilistically, um, there are um, uh, a, f a few, uh, I, I don't know, a handful of cells in her mammary tissue that have lost that second copy. Um, from that, that doesn't guarantee that she's getting cancer. Um, because BRCA2 is somewhat um, redundant with another gene, BRCA1, that also looks for broken DNA. Um, but, um, but, you know, she is at a position where she is likely having a few cells that are missing both copies of a, of a pretty important tumor suppressor gene. Not the most important one, which is P53, but a pretty important tumor suppressor gene. Um, there are r other redundant genes that are not BRCA2 that also look for similar kinds of DNA damage, like BRCA1 does. Um, and, so, um, and so that's why, unlike... Retino, retinoblastoma, where one, inheriting one bad copy basically guarantees you'll get tumors in your eye. Um, with BRCA2, inheriting one bad copy gives you a really high risk, like 50% chance of getting breast cancer by age 40 or 50, um, as compared to like 2% in the normal population. So that's a pretty dramatic increased risk, um, but not a guarantee because there are other proteins that are redundant. If you're missing all of the DNA damage proteins, every protein that looks for damage in DNA in a single cell, then that would be, that would be a guaranteed tumor cell um, out there. It's all of your DNA damage searching proteins. Um, so the proteins that make physical contact with the DNA, this little like bluish square here, represents many different genes, many different proteins, and they're somewhat redundant with each other. Does that kind of help? So if you're missing both copies of one, that increases your risk a lot, but doesn't guarantee it. Whereas if you're missing both copies of P53, which is like the critical, the most critical sort of central player, then that's basically a guarantee. Yeah. Yeah, other questions about that? So there are a lot of other proteins. There are a lot of different, like, bluish square proteins that can feed on into and activate P53. Um, and if you're missing many of them, then that's a real problem. Um, but, but, um, but missing both copies of one of them is a problem and a, and a significant risk, but not a guarantee. Um, and so P53 is in this DNA damage checkpoint. There are other checkpoints as well where cells check to make sure that DNA replication is appropriate, um, gets uh, checked for um, signals from the outside and other cells and so on um, that are necessary as well for cancer. Um, we talked a little bit about outside signals, uh, or sorry, necessary as well for cell division. We talked a little bit about outside <laughs> signals in terms of um, ABL1 especially, which is a proto-oncogene um, that normally... Um, will only become active when other cells send signals to 
their neighbors saying it's okay to divide, there's plenty of room here, we need more cells in this area. Um, but, uh, but a very particular, very unfortunate missense mutation in ABL1 can make it so that it's always active and acts like it's always getting these signals to divide, even when it's not. Um, and that then, then it transitions from being a proto-oncogene, which is the healthy version of ABL1, to an oncogene, which is the, um, the, the version where it's now active all the time, telling your cells always time to divide. So um, in this today, we're going to sort of just kind of hint a little bit at personalized medicine. Um, who's heard of like 23andMe and these other things? Yeah. So like there's these, these places where you can get your, um, get, uh, they don't actually sequence your entire genome. Um, what they do is they look for particular areas where there are known um, uh, polymorphisms or known places, no, no, known places in the genome where um, across all of the humans across the planet, there are known to be particular uh, single letter differences that exist in the genomes across many different people. Um, and so they can tell you, for example, at this one particular, one particular base in the genome, um, you know, there, uh, some people carry a T, some people carry an A, some people carry a C, maybe nobody, maybe nobody has Gs. Um, and so they'll tell you, well, you have one copy of a T and one copy of an A here. Um, and then at some other spot you have, you know, a, a two copy, both your copies, both mom and dad give you a T at that spot. Um, and so they look at um, uh, several hundred, maybe a couple thousand different spots in the genome out of the six bill or three billion bases uh, that you got from mom and three billion bases from dad. Um, they look they look at just a few thousand, maybe at most of those, um, and tell you you know you have one one chromosome that has this, one chromosome that has this. Um, uh, but just single letter locations, and these single letter locations um, are often not in a gene, but maybe right next to a gene, um, and the single letter itself may not actually carry any significance. It might not be in the promoter, it might not be anything, um, but it might just be that usually that single letter, and we'll sort of get into this a little bit more when we talk about linkage and multiple genes close to each other on a chromosome, if a single letter is close to a gene, then over many generations it's going to stay with a particular allele that might have some particular um, function. Um, and so they can tell you, for example, you have an increased risk of uh, developing uh, glaucoma or developing uh, cardiovascular disease or a decreased risk of developing certain types of cancer or an increased risk of Alzheimer's or whatever based on these single, um, uh, uh, single uh, base um, uh, 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 differences in your genome. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of like laws governing 23andMe and regulation, actually um, not even laws, but also regulations um, uh, from within uh, the FDA um, uh, in terms of what information should be made available to people who take, uh, who do this. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons why, um, so let's say for example that I went to 23andMe and I found out that I had a 50% decrease in heart disease and a 50% decrease in my cancer risk. Um, and then, um, but then I also find out that I have a doubling in my risk of nephritis, which is a, which is a kidney disease. Um, so, uh, or maybe even a triple risk of, of uh, so, so you know, I, I, get, I get back from 23andMe and I'm like, oh, phew. Half the risk of heart disease, half the risk of cancer. All right, cross those off my list. Don't need to worry about cancer. Um, but nephritis, oh my God, triple the risk of nephritis. Um, whatever I need to do, whatever nutritional supplements I can take that can like, uh, uh, help to keep my kidneys as healthy as possible, that's what I'm going to do. Um, what humans don't do appropriately is sort of think about baseline risk of pro uh, uh, when we're thinking about probabilities. Um, what we think about is we're sort of very sensitive to, to changing risk. Um, so um, this is just uh, national statistics from, from now from 10 years ago, but it's not very, ch 15 years ago, but, it's, but things don't change very much um, from this. And so 24% um, of people who die in the US die from, uh, from heart disease, another 23% die from cancer, and then everything else is sort of smaller than this. Um, uh, these are the top 15 causes of death 
um, uh, across, in, in, in the US. Um, and so if, um, so let's, let's just say that 23andMe tells me I've got half the risk of heart disease and half the risk of cancer and triple the risk of nephritis. Um, let's take two minutes and talk to your neighbors and figure out, so what's the probability I'm going to die of a heart attack? What's the probability I'm going to die of cancer? And what's the probability I'm going to die of nephritis, given that, you know, tri so again, triple nephritis, half for, for heart cardiovascular, and half for cancer. And yeah, write this down on some paper and we'll turn it in. Um, about 30 seconds or so to finish up. Okay, so so um, it it turns out the math can get a little bit complicated if you if you really dig into it. But um, to first, to anyone want to just sort of share what their group came up with for like how likely am I to die uh, if 23andMe is right about all this? How likely am I to die from these different things? Sure. Yeah. Still more likely to die from cancer and heart. Disease. Still more likely. Yeah. So what would you if you give a percentage to like my chance of cancer, for example? Twelve for cancer and heart disease and like. Yeah, something like that. So 12 and 9. So still, so this is elevated, maybe up to 10%. I mean, you know, maybe something I should be aware of, right? Like if there's some, if there's some simple thing that I can do to help my, uh, to help my kidneys, great. I should be aware of that. Um, actually, you, you, there's a little bit of a renormalization that you have to go through to get everything to add back up to 100%. So it ends up, uh, but everything gets renormalized by the same factor. So that's, um, you know, that's not not as as critical. Um, but uh, yeah, so it'd be sort of twelve percent, twelve percent, and nine percent ish um, chance. Um, it's maybe more like maybe more like fifteen, fifteen, and and twelve or something like that. Once you renormalize everything, um, so you know, the, a, a terrible thing for me to do with this information would be like, oh great, I'll just start eating red meat all the time, and I'll just start eating. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll pick up smoking because there's no risk of lung cancer for me and whatever. Um, but <laughs> by God, I better like you know take those kidney supplements all the time and be keep really really well hydrated um, and so so the FDA understandably doesn't want people or it worries about people taking this information without the context behind it of these sort of true risk factors of the big killers, let alone the individual environmental factors that come into play that contribute to your individual in, uh, uh, risk of accidents or cardiovascular disease or emphysema or lung cancer or whatever. Um, and so, um, and so. That's not to say that, that this information isn't appropriate for people to have. It's just that. Um, when you're processing, you know, uh, and, and you know, uh, it's 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 likely that in the next ten years, personalized medicine and, and these sorts of things are going to become more and more common for you. Um, and you know, and for uh, if if any of you go on to have children, um, they may get genotyped at birth, for all I know, by the time uh, you know, in the next 10, 10 years or twenty years or whatever. Um, and so, um, and so. Being aware of the context behind these numbers and not just the change in risk, but the absolute risks also is something that's, that's very important. Any questions about that? 
Okay, um, and so, uh, you know, there, there are a variety of different things that, um, uh, so, you know, changes in the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes, for example, can, um, can correlate with a huge increase, a 10 times increased risk of breast cancer, for example, or maybe like a three or four times increase in prostate cancer and other forms of cancer. It's not exclusive to breast cancer. Um, Huntington's disease um, is a neurodegenerative disease that's a single dominant trait. I mentioned it once or twice before as an example of a rare dominant mutation um, that can, uh, that, that, um, that can guarantee uh, a, a phenotype um, and a toxic phenotype. Um, uh, and so that is something that, uh, you know, if you had that would be worth knowing. Um, you can determine things about your ancestry, of course, as well um, by looking at the various chromosomes, which is another thing that 23andMe does. Um, but, you know, as you're, as you sort of, um, uh, dealing with this personalized medicine, um, there sh it's, it's important to sort of be sure to contextualize the numbers, and that's why they they have many disclaimers that say you know you shouldn't just look at your numbers on your own; you should discuss them with a physician, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Any uh, questions about any of that? Okay. So we're going to sort of switch gears a little bit and give a very brief introduction to the immune system. Um, so there there. Are, two, actually more like three or four um, um, different types of um, pathogens, broadly speaking, that your immune system has to deal with. Um, the two most common are bacteria and viruses. Um, there are also fungal infections um, and um, parasitic infections like malaria, which we'll talk about um, in the next unit. Um, uh, fungi are their sort of own kingdom or their own sort of branch of eukaryotes. Um, and parasites um, uh, make up a wide range of multiple different branches of eukaryotes um, that can invade and take over parts of your body as well. Um, but uh, today we're kind of going to think a little bit about viruses and a little bit more, a little bit more about viruses, a little bit about bacteria. Um, the reason there's this little ish associated with that um, is that, uh, as I mentioned on the first day of class, about half of the cells in your body um, are bacteria, and they are very important parts of a healthy digestive system. They also have an impact on um, other things that you wouldn't expect, um, like your body's ability to, um, by absorbing nutrients and synthesizing hormones and so on, they can have impacts on your uh, on your brain brain systems chemistry, even though the bacteria, um, when you're healthy, don't live in your brain, um, they change your uh, uh, body's chemistry in a way that has impacts on your mental and neurological health. Um, and they also play a role in, um, in uh, actually, a, a, a proactive role in the immune system. Um, uh, the way this is often described is that they help to train your immune system to prepare for um, uh, um, pathogenic invaders. And in fact, having a healthy complement of bacteria in your body, um, those bacteria will compete with any pathogenic invading bacteria that come into your body. And so they are themselves almost in any kind of part of your immune, uh, immunity as well by um, uh, fighting off other bacteria that might be invading your body. Um, viruses tend to, um, uh, I, I don't know of any um, naturally occurring viruses that are beneficial to your health, with the exception of viruses that attack maybe pathogenic bacteria or something like that. Um, but viruses that attack your cells, as far as I know, there's not any cases where they're beneficial to your health per se. Um, but one of the things that we'll talk about in a little bit is that your body, uh, is that, sorry, is that, is that um, uh, uh, scientists and even now physicians can use viruses to reprogram cells for research purposes and also now even for therapeutic purposes. Um, the immune system is kind of insanely complicated, um, and we could spend mo we could spend an entire semester just on the immune system. In fact, there is an advanced course that does exactly that. Um, but there are um, sort of cells uh, cells that are part of uh, um, what's known as um, the innate immune system, um, and these cells um, actually not this not this one column here of the lymphocytes, the T cells, and the plasma cells or the B cells, but everything else here is what's called the innate immune system. They find invaders based on sort of generic markers on the cell surface of invaders and eat them up. Um, the macrophages and dendritic, cell, cell, dendritic cells will also, when they find an invader and eat it up, will grab bits of the, the proteins from the surface of that invader, put that on the surface of their own cells, and then um, T cells that come along um, will um, 
will uh, sort of learn from those sur surfaces. Um, so a macrophage eats a bacteria. The macrophage puts some piece of the bacteria on its surface. A T cell comes along and says, oh, OK, we're being attacked by this thing. And the T cell starts to go looking around for other things that look like what the macrophage has put out as a warning. Um, B cells. Actually, well, there's another slide to look at that in a second. But, um, but B cells are the ones that produce antibodies. Um, there are, um, uh, and this slide again has a lot of complexity to it. Um, B cells ha have a wide diversity, um, uh, millions of possible antibodies that B cells can produce. Um, and these antibodies that they produce are essentially, you have just random B cells with random antibodies floating around in your body. But then when you get a vaccine, or you get an infection um, where there's some, there's some uh, antigen, there's some invader or some uh, sort of pseudo invader in a vaccine case that, um, that has a particular structure to it, then any B cell that happens to stick to that will go through a process where it divides many, many times. And so now, instead of having one or two B cells that stick to this virus that's invading you or this bacteria that's invading you, your body has um, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of B cells that are all making antibodies against this invader. And so that is how your body now develops an immunity where any more invaders that look like that will be easily targeted and quickly destroyed because now you've got a lot of B cells making antibodies that stick to them. Any questions about that? Very quick sort of overview. Um, so uh, like I mentioned before, this, this is sort of diagrams. Uh, macrophages are cells that find um, bacteria and viruses. And then what they will do is um, either on their own or with the help of antibodies, um, they will eat up the bacteria. And then they grab little pieces of the bacteria cell and uh, cell surface proteins and stick them out on the surface of their, their cells. And then a T cell will come along and recognize um, those and start to um, build your immunity um, to protect against these invaders here. Um, so in, in uh, your chest, sort of between your lungs, there's this tissue that um, for, uh, for so I've got like a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And for them, their thymus is actually quite large. It sort of like fills a good chunk of their chest. Um, for me, um, my thymus has, uh, has um, a little bit physically smaller and relative to my body size, quite a lot smaller than it is in my kids. Um, and, uh, and actually, a lot of my thymus gland now is just adipose fat tissue, um, uh, although there are still some functioning parts of it. Um, but that's one of the reasons why you get your vaccines as a kid. Um, uh, and so in the thymus is where so T cells are bo born in the bone marrow. That's where all blood cells, including B cells and other white blood cells and red blood cells are, are all born. But then the T cells go through a maturation process in the thymus. Um, and so um, young children have much more active production of T cells than, um, than older people do. Um, and so uh, T cell precursors um, get, uh, go into the thymus gland and get uh, turned into either what are called cytotoxic T cells um, or helper T cells. The cytotoxic T cells, when they f once they've learned what to look for by, the, by finding something on the macrophage, then when they see anything else that matches that, they will um, release proteins that break apart cell membranes and destroy whatever cell um, matches what they've learned to look for. The helper T cells, on the other hand, um, secrete something called cytokines that we'll talk about again in a couple minutes um, when they get activated by um, finding cells that match what they're looking for. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so, and so this is, a, again, a diagram of the T cell sort of learning uh, to become activated by a macrophage that has um, presented something on the surface. Yeah, sure. So when the cytotoxic T cell binds, or the, actually the T looks like, when it binds to an um, antigen-presenting cell, what is the chance that the the surface protein on the T lymphocyte actually has the correct surface. Yeah, that's similar to the antibodies where there are a lot of, where, the, where in all of the T cells in your body, there are many, many different surface proteins on them. And the ones that stick are the ones that get activated and the ones that proliferate. So is it again just by chance? Mostly, yeah. The T cells are a little bit smarter than the B cells and in ways that I don't actually fully understand. Um, but they're actually able to, to sort of adapt a little bit, but 
to a first approximation, it's again kind of by chance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so T cells can also attack tumors. And one thing that um, cytotoxic T cells look for, um, uh, are also known as natural killer cells, um, uh, one of the things that cytotoxic T cells look for are cells that have weird proteins on their surface. So if you see a cell in the liver, uh, if your T cell bumps into a cell in the liver that has some liver integrins, but also maybe some like spleen integrin proteins or whatever, then the T cell might recognize that this cell seemingly doesn't belong in this environment and kill it um, rather, um, uh, because it's much safer to kill a few cells than let weird cells that are possibly cancerous continue to live inside the organism. Um, and so your T cells, your immune system actually naturally is fighting cancer already. And we're kind of going to we're going to come back to that um, in a minute here. Yeah. So questions about any of that before we sort of move on to the other two topics here. Okay. So um, viruses in general. Um, uh, Actually, yeah, so viruses in general, their job is to reprogram cells. The way a virus replicates itself, unlike a cell which can divide by mitosis or binary fission if it's a bacterial cell, which is kind of the same thing or very similar, um, it, uh, cells have their own machinery for replicating their genome and dividing. What a virus does, though, is when it infects the cell, it inserts its own genetic material into that cell, and then that genetic material reprograms the cell to turn it, to make it stop doing whatever it was doing and start becoming a virus factory. Uh, and so, um, for example, if an HIV virus infects a T cell in your body, then that T cell stops being a T cell um, and starts being an HIV factory. And it makes tens of thousands of HIV virus particles before finally it breaks open and releases those 10,000 HIV virus particles into your blood, where they will then find more T cells to infect and turn into HIV factories. Um, and, uh, and so um, by, by inserting this genetic information, um, you're, the, the cells are getting reprogrammed. Um, the HIV um, actually has an RNA genome, which is a little bit confusing, but what happens is the RNA, it has RNA that gets converted back into DNA and then gets inserted into the, the chromosomes of the host cells. Um, that's a little bit complicated, but for right now, we'll just sort of say that HIV, again, reprograms T cells, and natural HIV that you, that, that, um, you, uh, that you find in the human population uh, among people that have HIV or AIDS um, is... Um, um, uh, functions and is replicating in their bodies by taking advantage of the T cells and inserting different genetic information into them. Does that kind of make sense? Questions about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, because because uh, your body's fighting back, and your body's um, uh, uh, so um, even if you have an active HIV infection, your body is fighting back and, and sort of keeping the viruses under control um, uh, by killing them off, um, and it's sort of a, 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 a back and forth war. Um, then, then in addition to that, um, you might take antiretroviral medications that prevent the virus, um, uh, that some of the specific enzymes in the virus that uh, that are necessary for infecting the cells or inserting its DNA into the cells from doing their jobs. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so it's like, um, so flu isn't a retrovirus, so it behaves a little bit differently, but it, again, it's sort of to a first approximation, it finds cells in your body and converts them into influenza factories. Um, and, um, and so um, some of the T cells will actually detect um, infected cells before they've burst out and let those 10,000 virus particles out and try and kill them before that. Or once those virus particles get out into your body, then they will 
try and attack and kill them, as will the antibodies um, try and attack and kill the, the viruses as well, and, or inactivate them at least. Um, but yeah, it's a constant sort of battle. Um, and that's why you, know, you get sick, and then you, you get a fever as well, which is sort of um, part of the, so um, the helper T cells, they secrete cytokines. And actually, um, what they do, so a, a cytokine is like an immune hormone. Um, and a cytokine will activate more immune cells, um, and then also um, and, and also give you a fever and other symptoms. Um, and then this, in turn, will mean more cytokines be released by those new active immune cells, and so more active immune uh, more immune cells get activated. Um, and so that's why you sort of that's actually why you feel crappy when you have a flu. It's not the flu itself; it's the it's the body's immune response to it. Um, but uh, but the helper T cells um, that that then turns up the production of B cells and T cells and sort of uh, um, turns on the attack against the the um, invading virus. Yeah, sure. Can you diagram where the retrovirus are of HIV? It says that once it's integrated the actual HIV genome into the host DNA, it will then recreate its RNA based off of transcription translation. Right. So then does that? Um, Integrated DNA ever gets spliced out again, or is it just? No, it just stays there forever. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Continues yeah, and actually, um, uh, if you look in the human genome, there are a lot of things that look like viral DNA that's been inactivated in everybody's genome, in all of the cells, in all of our bodies. It looks like our ancestors got infected by viruses, and then um, and then somehow the virus didn't replicate in their cells. And so there are um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of places in, in all of our genomes where you find viral DNA that's not active, um, that's been, that was integrated. It's been there for generations now, and it just is like this fossil viral DNA in all of our genomes. So yeah, it stays in there forever once it gets into integrated. Um, in, in the sort of natural course of things, when the T cell bursts open um, and dies as it releases all of the new HIV particles, that mutation is gone. But if it doesn't happen, then it stays there forever. If that doesn't happen, it stays there forever. Okay, so, <clears throat> so um, how does this all tie together into cancer, and how does this all sort of relate to, to um, what's going on here um, with, with um, cancer and personal, personalized medicine? Um, so this, this is um, Carl June. He's one of the researchers who um, pioneered some of this uh, cancer immunotherapy treatment um, together with this other guy, um, uh, David Porter. Um, and uh, in 2011, so six years ago, they, um, they had three patients um, who had um, very advanced um, leukemia um, who were expected to live for um, somewhere in the neighborhood of a few months. Um, and so based on some research that they'd already done on mice, they figured that, um, actually there was a lot of basic science that went into this, um, but they, they, what they determined is that um, if they sequence, they, so they extract some of the cancerous um, uh, lymphocytes from the patient's body, figure out what proteins this patient's individual cancer expresses. And again, because cancers aren't regulating and aren't um, monitoring their DNA, cancer is mutating a lot faster than the other cells in your body. And so um, one person's tumor is going to be different from another person's tumor in the sort of complement of proteins expressed on the surface, these integral membrane proteins. So what they did is for these three patients, for each of them, they sequenced what, they figured out what genes are being expressed in the cancer cells. And from that, they inferred what proteins were going to be on the surface of the cancer cells. Then they took an HIV virus, removed the genome from the HIV virus, and inserted in a, um, a different RNA genome that reprogrammed the T cell not to be an HIV factory, but instead to express proteins that will help it find and identify the specific tumor cells that these individual patients had. So for each patient, they found different surface proteins that the tumor cells were likely expressing, and then they um, 
made custom HIV viruses that reprogrammed the T cells to find and attack any cell expressing those surface proteins. And so the idea was that that will target and attack the tumor. And what they found um, is that um, within a month, this, I, I can't really read these bone marrow biopsies all that well, but this is apparently not so healthy, and this is how bone marrow is supposed to look. Um, but within a month, the bone marrow was already looking a lot better. And by six months, when this, these patients were expected to, to have already been dead, the patients were alive and cancer-free. So, um, so it was actually quite amazing. Um, their, T, their reprogrammed T cells um, uh, were able to attack and destroy their, um, their leukemia cells. Um, so skipping ahead a little bit, what they also found is that in both the bone marrow and the blood, these reprogrammed T cells persisted for many, many months, for, for more than six months. Um, after, they, they, they look, in the original publication, they just looked for the first six months. Um, but, but even beyond this, um, these reprogrammed T cells persisted. And actually, some of the modifications that they did were designed explicitly to keep those T cells around longer. Because you work so hard to like, reprogram these T cells to attack the patient's specific cancer that they then want to make sure that those stick around for a long time. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so you were talking about the reprogrammed HIV and then we switched the T cells. Right, so they reprogrammed the HIV. They, 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 the, the HIV um, had new genetic information inserted into it, and that new genetic information, instead of doing what HIV naturally does, which is reprogram a T cell to become a virus factory, we reprogram a T cell to attack your specific cancer. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, it's it's a so a couple a couple limitations. Um, uh, actually, so yeah, so so I mentioned so yeah, there there, there are a few limitations. Um, first, th there's this comic here that you can read that sort of points out some of the irony of it. Um, but we'll we'll sort of skip past that because we're short on time. Um, so um, they tried this on three patients. It worked really well. They tried it on three more patients. None of the three of them responded at all after they tried it on those. Um, and so they weren't really clear on that point whether they got lucky with the first three. Whether um, So one challenge is sometimes we know what protein a T cell needs to express to start attacking a particular surface protein on a tumor. But, um, and so if my tumor cells happen to express one of those known surface proteins, it's comparatively easy to, to f figure out how to reprogram my T cells to attack that. Does that make sense? But if my cancer is unusual and expresses unusual surface proteins, then there are um, challenges uh, in finding something that's going to properly attack my cancer. Another issue is this only works for leukemia and lymphoma because those are circulating cancers that circulate mostly in the blood. A lot of tumors are big masses, and so um, the, the T cells aren't going to be able to get into the sort of ball of tumor cells as easily. That's one challenge. One other challenge is related to these cytokines. So um, I mentioned before that um, cytokines activate immune cells, and then activate, and then by activating immune cells, they also activate immune responses, um, give you fever, and so on. Um, but um, they can turn on the production of more cytokines, which can turn into a dangerous positive feedback loop. And this is something called cytokine storm. Um, if you die from the flu, this is what kills you. It's not the flu that kills you. It's your immune system's response to the flu, um, the, the shock, the clotting, the lung injury, the fluid buildup in your body, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the fluid buildup in, uh, in your sort of uh, cardiac cavity and so on that kills you. Um, and so what they did in this first trial, this is from one of those first three patients, they monitored the cytokine levels and saw that they peaked and died off, which is exactly what they hoped to see. Um, there was, uh, so there was, a, um, the seventh patient in line was this uh, seven-year-old, six-year-old girl, Emily Whitehead. Um, so um, what happened with her is that unlike those first few patients, the immune, the immune response, the cytokines didn't turn up and turn back down, but they turned up and stayed up. 
And so as a result of that, um, she went into this immune overdrive, this cytokine storm, spent two weeks on a ventilator, um, and uh, the, the researcher sent an email message to the, to the director of the program saying that they thought that the pediatric patient was likely to die. There's nothing to do at that point. Sorry, I always get a little bit choked up about this because I think about my own kids. But um, then, then they gave her some um, anti-arthritis medication that turned down her cytokines and sort of like at the last minute saved her life. Um, and so, you know, now she's 10 years old and cancer-free. Um, but, uh, I mean, so... so the point of all this is to illustrate that there's a lot of difficulty and complexity, and your body's own systems can sort of become problematic in this as well. Um, nonetheless, it's beginning to be used more broadly, and it has been approved as a, as a, a treatment that can be prescribed. It's very expensive, but yeah. Anyway, on your way out, 